Let's talk about the endocrine system. There is mom and dad and the little parasite. Isn't that cute? So let's remember about cells talking to each other. There are a few different ways this can happen. That has to happen. You, cells of your body have to talk to each other in order to let each other know what's going on. Well, you wouldn't make it otherwise. So gap junctions, remember from BIO 156, you can see there in the top right. Um, that allows ions and other things possibly as well to move directly from one cell into another. Neurotransmitters, remember the nervous system, one neuron releases neurotransmitters which bind to receptors on another neuron. That's how a neuron tells another neuron to uh, to engage in some activity, to, to send off action potentials that will cause something to happen. All right. Paracrines, remember, are local transmitters, all right, from one cell to another. You see in the bottom right, paracrine cell releasing paracrines, nearby cell paracrine receptors, that's how one cell talks to another. Notice also the autoreceptors, that's how you can control the degree of communication. Hormones is what we're going to be talking about now in the endocrine system. And hormones, we're going to use a really strict definition here. Hormones travel in the blood. The other ones don't. Okay? Now, we'll see there's kind of an exception. Some neurotransmitters are released directly into the blood. And we call them neuroendocrine um, hormones, transmitters, whatever. Um, so, um... Hormones, we're, we're always going to insist that a hormone travels in the blood. So notice the contrast between paracrine and endocrine. Paracrine, you know, like some of the trucking films, you know, or firms, uh, local, long distance. Paracrine are local, hormones, long distance, okay? So components of the endocrine system, hormones are the actual chemical messengers. Um, so look on the right there, you can see a secreting cell secretes it where? into the blood. It travels long distance to perhaps another part of the body very far away, leaves the blood, and then has to bind to a receptor there to cause something to happen. Remember with neurotransmitters, for the most part, with few exceptions, there had to be a receptor for the neurotransmitter, otherwise nothing happened. Well, the same is true for hormones. There has to be a receptor. We'll see coming up about an endocrine disorder in which Individuals have the hormones, but they don't have receptors for them. Therefore, there can be no effect of that hormone. Target cells out in the body have to have the receptors, like I'm saying. Hormones are released one place, travel through the blood, leave the blood someplace else, and then bind to receptors on target cells. Endocrine glands are the structures that contain endocrine cells that secrete the hormones. Okay, So they produce the hormones. And the endocrine system is basically all of this together. The, all of the endocrine organs, and um, there are also hormone producing cells in other organs, the brain, the heart, the small intestine. So remember in the atria, uh, we released ANP, a hormone. There are endocrine cells in the atria that release ANP. So these are just basic definitions, but oftentimes I see people getting confused because they don't remember the basic definition, and that's what gets them in trouble. So try to get these solid in your head. That will help you avoid making mistakes later. Endocrine organs, there are a bunch of them. All right, let's start talking about them. The pineal on the posterior side of the brain stem. The hypothalamus, which is part of the brain, but it makes and secretes hormones. So it is really an, an, an organ of the nervous system and also an, an organ of the endocrine system as well. Pituitary gland um, hangs right below the hypothalamus. It releases many hormones. Pituitary gland often called the master gland of the endocrine system because it releases hormones that tell other endocrine glands what to do. The thyroid gland, they're in your throat by the thyroid cartilage. We know all about that. Parathyroid glands on the back side of the thyroid. All right, you can see in the middle right there, parathyroid glands on the back of the thyroid. The thymus, we saw that when we did the lymphatic system. Remember, that's where T cells go to boot camp. The adrenal glands on top of the kidneys. The pancreas, both an exocrine and an endocrine gland, as we well know. 
and the gonads, those are the ovaries and the testes. Um, endocrine system is quite similar between mammals. Look at the dog. Essentially the same things. So a lot of conservation between mammals and hormones. Not 100%, but a lot of things are similar. Endocrine versus exocrine, just to try to hammer this one more time. Endocrine are released where? Into the blood. Exocrine release where? Either outside the body or into the lumen of an organ. All right. So exocrine glands, ducts carry the secretion to the surface or to an organ cavity, the lumen. They have generally extracellular effects such as food digestion, sweating to cool the body. Endocrine glands have no ducts. The hormones are released into tissue fluids and then immediately taken up into the blood. So again, in the bottom right, see the endocrine cells releasing the hormones into the interstitial fluid. They are then taken up into the blood. They, in another part of the body, they are released back into the ISF and they diffuse through the ISF and bind to receptors on target cells. All right? They generally have intracellular effects. Hormones are incredibly powerful. They often change the very metabolism of the cell. They have profound effects. Keep that in mind. Let's compare and contrast nervous and endocrine systems. Remember, of the 11 organ systems of the human body, who are the two systems that control the rest? That's right, nervous and endocrine. Let's look at some similarities and some differences. With respect to communication, the nervous system, remember, was both electrical and chemical. Electrochemical, we said. So, graded potentials and action potentials are electrical signals, but they cause the release of neurotransmitters, which are chemicals. So it's both electrical and chemical. Endocrine system is strictly chemical. Hormones released into the bloodstream travel long distances, have effects. With respect to speed and persistence, the nervous system is very fast. Just milliseconds, all right? So action potential, whoosh, you know, and then once the action potential stops, then the response stops, all right? Unless you get several action potentials quickly in a row, you know, each action potential causes a release of a, a, a quantum of neurotransmitters, but then that's it, it stops. Endocrine, very different. Hormones released in seconds or days, um, effect may continue for weeks. So think of the bodybuilders who use the anabolic steroids to bulk up. Do they take a shot of steroids and they wake up the next day and they're like, look like the Pillsbury Doughboy or like the Michelin Tire Man? Are they all bulked up overnight? No, it takes days, weeks to do that, all right? So endocrine system is a much slower response. With respect to adaptation, the nervous system response declines quickly. Remember like adaptation to smell, adaptation to darkness, um, your sensory organs, they adapt very quickly, all right? Endocrine, the response persists much longer. Think again in terms of the bodybuilders using the steroids. Once they stop doing steroids, do they like shrivel up overnight and go back to normal? No, it's days or weeks before they go back to normal, okay? So again, long-term effects of endocrine. With respect to area, nervous system very targeted and specific. When an action potential goes to your biceps brachii and your brachialis and your coracobrachialis, those are the only things that move, all right? Whereas endocrines, once hormones get into the blood, they go everywhere in your body and they have widespread effects everywhere, okay? So notice those differences. They're, these are the two control systems, but they do it in very different ways and their method of control has very different characteristics, okay? So again, looking here at the two of them together, um, some chemicals are both hormones and neurotransmitters. There is overlap between these two systems, okay? So norepinephrine, CCK, TRH, dopamine, which is also a prolactin inhibiting hormone, and ADH, they all function as both hormones and neurotransmitters. Some hormones are secreted by neuroendocrine cells. So there are neuroendocrine cells that secrete hormones directly into the bloodstream oxytocin, and the catecholamines. Remember in the adrenal medulla, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine get dumped into the bloodstream. Yes, they have effects as neurotransmitters, but their effects as hormones were much more powerful because they go everywhere in the body and affect all the tissues throughout your body. 
Systems can have overlapping effects. So norepinephrine and glucagon both promote glycogenolysis in the liver, all right? So nervous system, endocrine system may go together to do things. And they regulate each other as well. Neurons trigger hormone release, and hormones stimulate or inhibit neurons. So a lot of overlap here. There are big differences, but there's overlap as well. Just get used to that, okay? Bottom left there, Warren G. Nate Dogg. Can't believe Nate Dogg is dead. Oh my God, a few years ago. And again, talking about the overlap of the nervous and endocrine systems. There you see the, the overlapping circles in the bottom right. Now, some people are smart, some people are hot, some people are awesome, and there are people like me, you know, who are all three. I can't help it, you know, it's just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, rest of the world. Uh, it's just not something I can control. Let's start talking about specific entities of the endocrine system. So the hypothalamus. Remember the hypothalamus is part of the brain. It is the homeostatic control center of the brain and of your entire body. Remember there's, it's got like a big giant wall of gauges and dials. It's monitoring everything. Blood sugar, acid base, osmolarity, body temperature, etc, etc. Well, once the hypothalamus detects that something's not going correctly, it's got to fix the problem. It can do that either by activating the nervous system or the endocrine system. So in Bio 201, we looked at the nervous system and how the nervous system could control the body. Now we're going to focus on the endocrine system. So, yes, the hypothalamus monitors our body, regulates essential functions, everything from water balance to sex drive. Remember the four Fs? So... And the pituitary gland, which is, you can see that hanging right down below the hypothalamus, it's often called the master gland of the endocrine system. It's under control of the hypothalamus. It doesn't really do things on its own. But nonetheless, it releases hormones that tell other endocrine glands what to do. So pituitary gland, incredibly essential in regulating um, endocrine responses throughout the entire body. So let's zoom in here on the pituitary gland and let's just look at the diagram in the bottom right for a moment. Notice there is the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary, called the adenohypophysis, it is a gland. The posterior pituitary, the neurohypophysis, is essentially neural tissue. It basically consists of projections of the cells up in the hypothalamus that project down into the posterior pituitary and then release two hormones there, oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. So the pituitary is really, notice, we said that the two organ systems that control the rest of the body are nervous and endocrine. Well, the pituitary is where those two systems come together. It's where they merge. Nervous and endocrine all coming together, all right? Isn't that sweet? It's just like one of those movies on the on the oxygen channel or on the what are those other channels the Oprah channel and stuff a lifetime um, where a nervous endocrine come together yes master gland of the endocrine by golly suspended from the hypothalamus by the infundibulum um, it's housed in the hypophysial fossa in the cella turcica of the sphenoid bone which you know very well from bio 201 since the pituitary is so critically important it's basically encased in bone to protect from damage, all right? So um, your body realizes how crucial the pituitary is and it surrounds it with bone basically on all sides. About the size of a pea, all right? Some of you, I don't know, only eat pizza and drink beer. Um, go to the store sometime, look, they have peas there. See how big they are. That's about how big your pituitary is. So again, the adenohypophysis, the anterior pituitary, um, outgrowth of the pharynx, you don't have to know that. It's glandular tissue. Neurohypophysis, posterior pituitary, arises from the brain. It is neural tissue, okay? So that's our basic overview. Let's uh, see how it went. So which of the following uh, produced the most general and widespread effects? Would that be A, neurotransmitters, B, hormones, C, paracrine secretions, D, exocrine secretions, E, all of the above are the same or similar? Pause the video, think of the answer, come back when you're done, and by golly, there we are. Hormones, long distance, affecting the entire body, okay? 
And as usual, in order to reward myself for doing this, I have to put in pictures of where I would rather be. I'm standing out at a place called Dead Horse Point, looking down on a big horseshoe bend in the Colorado River. It's not the horseshoe bend that most people go to. There are lots of horseshoe bends. But uh, that's the Potash Road down there in the right foreground. This is its very near here where Thelma and Louise, uh, they filmed that you know, going over the edge. I drive the Potash Road every year. This is just a beautiful place. This is about 300 miles upstream from the Grand Canyon, so you can see the Colorado River basically over its entire course, across the entire Colorado Plateau, just carves amazing canyons. Okay, I'll see you in the next video.